that's quite, that's quite a buildup here to get started. <laughs> Let's stand together and sing And Can It Be. It's number 134 in your hymn books. Number 134, And Can It Be.
That last verse, no condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. But I love the third verse. Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. And it was a dark, dark night. But God's eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amen. I mean, the quickening, life-giving work of God's spirit in our life and no condemnation now we have. Let's bow and thank him. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to know the working of your power bringing spiritual life in us. And Lord, we pray today that that quickening power would be at work in every one of our lives Lord, I pray that your spirit would make clear the mind of you through every song we sing, through every word that is spoken. And we want you to know we are dependent totally on your spirit to do the work today. Lord, you alone know the needs. You alone have the power to minister in our lives. And Lord, we rejoice today that we are brought to a relationship with you, that it isn't some just dead motions that we go through, that it is a living, growing relationship with you. And so, Lord, we plead your mercies. We pray that you would be pleased through our responses to truth today. And, Lord, we thank you that we can look to you in Jesus' name Amen. You may be seated. A few weeks ago, we were working on learning a new, a new song to us, Our Sovereign God. And uh, we want to uh, sing that again this morning. And you think of the words and rejoice in the truth of it. We'll have the words for you on the overhead to Our Sovereign God. Our sovereign God, by his own word, sustains this world and reigns as Lord. No angel, demon, sinful man can change his course, restrain his hand. O sovereign God, we praise your power. Those he loved before 
one's return will in this age the lamb will come in glorious mind take back his world and end its night how deep the Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 for our scripture reading today. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> the believers at Thessalonica had um, cause to believe that maybe the day of the Lord had already come and they missed out, and um, some even believe that there was a letter written to him forged in Paul's name. So Paul is writing to correct some things to them, and in chapter 2 we read, Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Now, you remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he said, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and, and he talked about the rapture of the church. So he's writing to them to correct that. And he says in verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So that's reference to the Antichrist, that he... The man of sin will be revealed. He'll sit as God in the temple of God. And um, so he's referring to the Antichrist there. Then verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may re be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. He's mentioning the restrainer, the one who holds back evil. That is the Holy Spirit. And he says the, the work of lawlessness is already at work in the world, but the Holy Spirit, the restrainer, is holding back the evil to a certain degree. It can't have full reign. And there's coming a day when he will be taken out of the way. And verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed. The lawless one being Antichrist, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So uh, we'll be looking more at this this morning. And um, we rejoice that the truth of God's word, as we sang in the song about our sovereign, sovereign God, he has written history's final page. His son's return will end this age. And we 
rejoice in those truths. Invite your attention to the overhead for the song, When Trials Come. Let's sing this song together, When Trials Come. When trials come, no longer fear, for in the pain our God draws near to fire a faith worth more than gold. And there His faithfulness is told, and there His faithfulness is told. Within the night I know your peace, the breath, God brings strength to me. Let's stand together as we sing the song, A Passion for Thee, A Passion for Thee. It's number 371 in your hymn books, number 371, A Passion for Thee. Set my heart, O oh dear Father, on Thee and Thee only, give me a thirst for Thy presence. Set a fire in 
got a little rambunctious here with the scripture meet reading, and um, and I jumped over a song that we were going to sing, and I'm going to ask Jason if he'll come lead us in this song before we look to God's word. I wasn't the only one watching wrestling this week, right? <laughs> we know Pastor too. All right, let's get after it. We bow down, right? Let's sing this song together. We'll have the words for you on the overhead. We bow down. and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea, you were Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all, Lord, you will be, we bow down and we worship you. to 2 Thessalonians again, 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> How many of you have been, whether you've camped there or not, have been to the campground at Red Rock that is right below the dam? You're familiar with it, maybe riding bikes, you started there. I don't know if any of you have have been there and maybe camped there and thought, what would happen if that dam broke while we're here? How many of you have ever had those thoughts, huh? Okay, so I'm not the only one, all right? Now, that would be a profound event, needless to say, and, and if you were walking up around that area and all of a sudden you saw a little crack open up in the dam, but just a little bit of water was coming through, you probably wouldn't go back to your camper and say, let's sign up for another week here. Um, you'd probably say, hook it up, get out of here, we're done, because you're not a fool, right? Well, in the passage that we're looking at today, as we mentioned earlier, Paul said that he was writing to try to calm some of their fears, that maybe they had missed out on the Lord's return. And in it, and continuing in our studies that we're doing in Sunday evening, where do we go from here? It's mentioned up to this far with our studies, various things that events that God says will happen that will happen before he actually comes the second time to set up his kingdom. But Paul says these events will happen and as you start to see them happen, as you see the shadow of these events falling on our days, look up for your redemption draws near. And so He's saying, you're starting to see some of these things happen, 
and you see the fulfillment of these things, it ought to make us more zealous in our love for God and more passionate in our love for the lost and love for one another. But one of the things that he says in this passage, he says, these days will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin be revealed. The falling away, two things he says here, the falling away comes first and the man of sin will be revealed. If you've done your studies in the book for tonight, you understand the falling away is the term from which we get the word apostasy, to depart from the faith. Well, there have always been individuals that have departed from the faith. We read in the Bible, Judas, one of the first examples. We read about Demas. Paul wrote that he was a fellow worker, but Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, Timothy, make sure you hold faith in a good conscience, which some haven't done concerning faith, and their faith has ended up being shipwrecked. And he, and he called out to people. He said, two of them, that that's true, it's Hymenius and Alexander that they've apostate, they've, they've departed from the faith. Apostate is not, is not an atheist. It's not an unbeliever in the sense of just a straight unbeliever. An apostate is someone who claimed to be a believer, never was, and then abandoned their profession. So, they claim to be a believer and, and may have gone through many of the motions of believers and maybe identified as believers and maybe been leaders of believers. But there came a point where they abandoned their profession. They abandoned their belief. Um, I'm not going to go into details to take the time, but <clears throat> we are seeing that even yet in our day. And uh, to say more so in our day, maybe, I, I can't qualify that, so to speak. But I know this, there have always been people that have professed to be believers and then have become apostate, meaning they have turned away from their profession of faith and denied it. And we may talk more about that in, in some regard. Now, when this happens and other believers see it, sometimes it is, it is unnerving to them. Sometimes it may have been someone that they looked up to and... and um, and respected, and maybe their life has been benefited by them, and then they turn from the faith, they deny the faith, and, and sometimes it is very uh, unnerving to people. Um, there's a man by the name of Josh Harris who has written um, a number of books, written them as a believer, um, written an excellent book regarding the church. But several years ago, he came out and said that um, I, I no longer identify as a Christian. I know what a Christian is, and that's not me anymore. And I've completely abandoned that and gone his own way, and, and I don't know what his own way even is now. And to some, they might say, but, but look at he, his ministry blessed me here. How can this be? Um, one thing that we should learn from this passage is 
nothing should surprise us. In fact, we should expect there to be fallings away. So, um, there's a lot of things running through my mind, but I don't want to chase all those rabbits, okay? But there, in, in my life and ministry, there have been others that I looked up to in the ministry and valued that have fallen away. There was a fellow pastor early in our ministry that seemed to have a great ministry, a great family, and he abandoned the faith, uh, came out and said and pursued an alternate lifestyle, sodomy, and, and it was like, you got to be kidding me. But if you are in the faith, you must come to the point where, you know what? I don't know all that's going on, but it's not going to surprise me when things happen. And not surprise us because God said there will come a falling away. And it ought to make us come back and step back and say, I can only trust God and I can fully trust God. Because someone that says they're a follower of God, abandoned God, that doesn't change anything about God. My faith is not in a man, my faith is in God. And, and I don't understand it all, but God, God used a donkey to get his message across. God uses strange ways to get his message across. But because someone that apparently was used of God is an apostate, has abandoned the faith, that doesn't disregard God. Our faith is in God, not man. And, and we must be very, very careful about this. God uses people in your life, and God may have used someone uniquely and very godly in your life to help bring you to salvation or to help you really grow. But your faith is in God, not that person. And that person will fail you. And that person will let you down because we're humans. We're, we're very fallible. We, we fail. We fall. We make mistakes. We sin. But thankfully, our faith is in God. And so, it's not like we should go around looking for people that have fallen but when it happens, it shouldn't shake our faith. It shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't say, oh my goodness, if, if that person has abandoned the faith, is the faith real? No, our faith is real because it's based in God and the promises of God. And we must know this personally. That's why you can't build your faith with, my pastor told me this, or this person told me this, or this book told me this, or I read this on the internet, it must be you know what God says. Now, the dangerous part of this is an apostate, the definition, someone who claimed to be a believer but never was. We'll, we'll get to this in a little bit. They weren't a believer and lost their salvation. And we'll get to that in a little bit. They profess to be a believer, but they never were. And it was revealed, eventually it was revealed what they really were. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. This, this is so important that in Matthew chapter 7... Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> went into great detail regarding this. 
He said in verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a... Lost my place here. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Then he says, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and he goes into the very familiar account, the wise man built his house upon the rock. And the storms, the rains came, the storms came, the floods came, the winds blew, and the house on the rock stood firm. Because it was genuine faith. The foolish man, the man who heard the sayings of God and did them not, is the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains descended and the floods came, winds blew, beat upon the house, and it fell and great was the fall of it. Now you notice all of this Jesus is saying, beware, there are going to come false teachers. By their fruits you will know them. Does a a good tree bring forth corrupt fruit? And he's teaching all this. And there will be people, he says, that say to me, Lord, Lord, we attended Grace Baptist Church. We were faithful there. We did these wonderful works in the community. And, And we even cast out demons. And he will say to them, you were once saved, but you lost it. No, that isn't what it says, is it? Depart from me, I never knew you. You never did belong to me. And and he said, many will say to me those things, and they will hear these final words, depart from me, Ye that work iniquity. Iniquity is self-will. I can't think of anything more tragic than Matthew 7, verse 21. That they had this belief that they were a child of God. And then to find out all these things that they did... They never knew him. And so today, in the, S, in, the, in the thought of falling away, I, I like to say you can't fall away unless you've fallen in. I prefer to call it the great revealing rather than the great falling away. It's going to be a revealing of what's in their hearts. But this morning, in the time that remains, I want us to look at evidences of genuine salvation. The last thing I would want for anyone here is to have the rude awakening of Matthew 7.21. To think that they're saved and are not. And one of the things that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and the church at Corinth had a lot of issues because there were people in it, okay? Every church has issues because there's people in it, all right? And and he wrote to them, and he concluded his letter to them, his second letter to them, and he said, examine yourself to see that you are in the faith. So I want to give seven evidences of 
genuine salvation. Now, <clears throat> I want you to apply these to your own life. I don't want you to apply them to somebody else in the church. I don't want you to apply them to your kids or your parents. This is for us to take self-examination. Number one, there will be a new awareness of right and wrong. If I am truly born again, if I have truly trusted Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin, there will be a new awareness of right and wrong because God said that he gives to the believer his spirit. The Spirit of God dwells within every believer. Romans 8, if any man has not the Spirit of God, he doesn't belong to God. What is the Spirit's ministry? The Spirit's ministry is to guide us into truth. And once we have trusted Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin, the Spirit of God dwells within us, and he starts pointing out things to us. He starts saying, this would be a good thing to do. Things that we we never thought about before. And he also starts pointing out things that you shouldn't be doing that. There have been, there have been people that, that had, for example, had very foul, foul mouths and didn't even know it. They, they didn't even know that, that they were taking God's name in vain or filthy mouth. But when they get saved, there's a new awareness. And, and people give testimonies to saying, you know, I, I didn't even realize I was doing this. And all of a sudden it was like, hey, you shouldn't be. To me, that's a perfect testimony that the Spirit of God is dwelling within them. It wasn't a preacher telling them they shouldn't do it. It wasn't a husband or wife telling them. It's the Spirit of, the Spirit of God telling them. There is a new awareness of right and wrong. Secondly, there is a new desire for the word of God. <clears throat> Second Peter 2.2 2 says, if any, what does it say? Um, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. Now, it, it's a joy to see the new babies come into the church. And it's a joy to see them grow. And why are they, they growing? Because it's natural for them to desire the milk that they may grow. It is natural for a believer to desire the milk of the word that they may grow. If you don't have a desire for the word of God, there's something majorly wrong. There may not be life there. If, if you don't have a desire to, to read the word. Now, I understand it's spiritual warfare. Satan wants to prevent us from it. But there ought to be, <clears throat> in a genuine believer, <clears throat> a desire for the word of God. A desire to to know his will, a desire to know about God, that's given to us because the Holy Spirit is in us. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. The Holy Spirit then draws us to the Bible so that we can grow. See, honestly, no one should be telling you, get in the Word, get in the Word, get in the Word. I believe in accountability, kind of, because if you don't want to be held accountable, it's not going to matter. You know what I'm saying? But I believe the fear of the Lord and the love of the Lord ought to drive us to the Word. And, and if, if we do not have a desire for the Word of God, we better go back and check some things. Now, let me just say, I am not my heart's desire is not to make saved people doubt whether they're saved. But it is my desire to make unsaved people question whether they are saved or not. And if, 
If what Jesus said in Matthew 7, by their fruits you shall know them. If you look at your life and you really don't have a desire for the word other than guilt, well, I guess I better read the word. Well, I want the day to go good for me, so I guess I better read the word. It's my lucky charm or whatever, you know. No. There, there should be a desire for the word of God. Thirdly, there will be a new desire to be like Christ that he puts within us. He has predestined that we should be conformed to the image of his son. It's not be like Mike, it's be like Christ. That, that's our, our goal. I want to be like Christ. What would Christ do in this situation? How would Christ parent? What, how would Christ work? In this, this situation that's come up, what would Christ do? How can I be more a reflection of the character and nature of God? Fourthly, there will be a new love for other believers. And, and in 1 John, and, and let me just say, if, if you're struggling today with, with your salvation... That is something that demands utmost attention. And 1 John, you should go and saturate in 1 John. But in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, verse 13, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brethren abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, this is where it gets down to the nitty-gritty, right? We're called to love our brethren, and some of our brethren are pretty hard to love, right? Okay, look at me. Pretty hard to love? I love the statement, the gospel light attracts many a strange bug. But if we have the love of Jesus Christ in us, we will have a desire to love them. We will call upon God for grace and strength to love them. We will have a desire for gathering together. See, that's, that's part of church. Church isn't just to come and show up and hear a preacher preach one hour a week. It's the ministry of the body together. If we don't want to get together, well, don't tell me. It's just me and God, me and God. Well, then you better cut 1 John 3 out of your Bible and John 13, 34 out of your Bible and a lot of other things out of your Bible. You can't love God without having a commitment to love one another. It's impossible. And there are many that will say, Lord, Lord, we did all these things. And he'll say, depart. There is no evidence. There will be a genuine growing in love for one another. Fifthly, there will be a new peace. There will be a new peace that that we understand when we are born into this world, we are born, made in the image of God, made for fellowship with God, and we are wired that way. Until we are brought to fellowship with God, we will have no peace. We may try to fill it up with anything else, and we may try to fill it up with church. But... Church itself will not give us peace of mind. Have you ever wondered why, why there are, are church members that are just miserable? Well, we could do a whole series on that. But um, if you don't know Christ, you can't be happy. You can't have peace. And any peace that ha you have is is artificial, it's a veneer, 
and it passes away, Jesus said in John 14, My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, but I give you genuine peace. You are at peace because you understand, you know, this is bad, but God is able to make all things work together for good. You are at peace because you see the big picture as we sang in the song, Our Sovereign God. You have a new peace. It doesn't mean that we get, don't get troubled, but when we're troubled, we go to him, Philippians 4, casting all our care upon him, making our request with thanksgiving, and then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, works in our lives. So a genuine, a genuine believer has new peace. A genuine believer has a new purpose in life. The purpose in life for a believer is that we should be to the praise of his glory. Ephesians 1, 12. That we should live to glorify God. It's not about building a name for myself. It's not about uh, proving what a great businessman. It's not about winning Citizen of the Year Award. It's not anything about me. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And we have a whole new purpose. And that purpose changes everything. No matter what happens in the economy, my purpose stays the same, to glorify God. No, what, no matter what happens with my health, my purpose stays the same, to glorify God. No matter what happens politically, I still have the same purpose. The purpose for me today and the Ukrainian believers today and the believers in Nigeria today that are suffering and persecution, it's still the same for all of us. We are here to glorify God. And number seven, an evidence of genuine salvation is that we will be disciplined by God. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Have you ever been in a situation where you were with your family or maybe you weren't with your family? Let's say you were in a store and you saw some little kid, just a little hellion, just carrying on, and you, and you think, I'd like to take that kid over my knee and teach him a thing or two. Well, why didn't you? You turn around and yours is doing the same thing, so you snatch him up and you teach him some things about life and respect and that. One is your son or daughter, and the other isn't. And the ones that you genuinely love, that are part of your family, you discipline. The point is not about discipline here, so don't get off in the weeds there, okay? The point is, you only discipline those that are your children. <clears throat> Do believers disobey God? Absolutely. Does God come down with the heavenly paddle and just whack us into next week? There's many, many ways to discipline kids. You know, <clears throat> there were times when Asa was younger that I'd just, I'd try to get his eye, like, you know, give him the hairy eyeball look. <laughs> like, that's enough. Or sometimes it's, it's this number, you know, you knock it off. I see what you're doing, knock it off. There have been times when those don't work. And there have been times that I have been known to say, Asa, enough or Isaac, or Care, or Caleb, or any of them. There have been times I've wanted to do it to your kids. <laughs> the point of this is, God isn't looking to spank people. He's looking to bring us back to fellowship with him. And he loves to do the most, the least intrusive. 
He loves to just have us read the word and think, oh my, oh my, I'm in air here. But there's times he turns us over to the reproofs of life. There's times we planted these seeds and he said, you're going to have to reap them. There's times he disciplines us in different ways. And he says, don't despise the spankings of the Lord. That's evident that you're not an illegitimate child. That's proof you belong to God. Rejoice in that. Now, we can't go around thinking, oh, I don't know. I don't know what God's doing in their life. I don't know if they're a child of God. That's none of your business. We don't know what God's doing. But the fact of the matter is, we must examine ourselves. And, and it is so important that we aren't the ones that will be revealed are not genuine. So, boy, I'm going to have to really rush through this, but solutions to this. In Jude 3, it says, earnestly contend for the faith. In Hebrews chapter 2, it says, give, give earnest heed that you don't drift from the truth. Meaning, you never really were latched in there. You never really were locked in there. We need to give heed. In, in 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And he lists all these things, virtue, knowledge, temperance, so on. Giving all diligence. If, if you have faith, this is what you'll do. And then if you do, you'll be fruitful. So if you're here today and you say, you know what? I look at these evidences and I don't see much of them in my own life. Number one, you must repent. Meaning you turn from your own self-will and turn to God, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. There are people that are church members of a good church, of this church. There are people that have been baptized. There are people that are faithful to church, but they've never repented of their own, own ways. And they will perish. Your membership in any church is, is, avails you nothing. There must be genuine repentance. Number two, <clears throat> to keep from drifting, to keep from <clears throat> turning from the faith, keep a clear conscience. 1 Timothy 1.18, we alluded to it earlier. Paul wrote to Timothy, holding faith and a good conscience which some having put away concerning faith, have made their faith shipwrecked. We must continually be pursuing a, a clear conscience. When the Holy Spirit says to you, hey, that wasn't right what you did, you need to go back and make things right. Then you go back and make things right. You pursue a clear conscience. Number three, take personal inventory often in your life. The psalmist prayed, Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and see if there be any wicked way within me. See, we don't confess sin because we never examine to see if we've sinned. We've never paused enough to say, God, I want you to search me. Take personal inventory often. Number four, it's about loving God. Loving God. It's not about legalistically do this, do this, do this. If you love God, there will be things that you do. If I love my wife, there will be things that I do to honor and show my love. But I can do things without loving her, and it will be vain and empty. So it, it is God, the first and greatest command to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then we've alluded to it earlier, love others. A new command I give to you, John 13, 34, 
that you love one another. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Now this command that you love one another. He that does not love his brother, the truth does not abide in him. What does that mean? He doesn't belong to God. If you're here today and there are any, any inkling of doubts about your salvation, you need to, to make the number one priority in your heart and life, not just today, but settling that matter. And, and it may be a, a process of searching after God. And you might say, it's not a process, it's just trusting God. But God brings many of us through different processes of trusting God to where we know that our faith and trust is in him and him alone. This, beyond any question of a doubt, is the most important issue in life. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Heavenly Father, I alone come before you, and you know my heart. And Lord, I come before you and just ask that you would take the truth of your word and bear it home to every one of our hearts here today. Lord, forbid that there would be anyone listening today that would hear you say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. God, I can't think of any, anything worse. And so, Lord, you know each heart. You know what's going on in each heart. And I pray that we would be sensitive to the promptings of your spirit, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen.